Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay, last time we talked about solving a linear system, finding the solution set description using matrix and vector notation. And this time I want to give some uh, justification for that. I want to explain why we're so keen on matrix and vector no notation. In particular, it enables us to characterize the solution set of the linear system. We can completely understand what solutions look like. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start off by backing up to the previous slide, the, the slide that we showed in the last video at the end. We had a linear system like so, we did Gauss's method like so, we came up with a complete solution set written in vector notation. And you notice that it has really two parts. There's a part of a vector of constants, and you also notice that the, um, the, the remainder of the solution set has something associated with z, something associated with w. So there's vector times letter, vector times letter. We want to show that every solution set can be written in that form. Particular here, this is called. Homogeneous here, this is called. So there'll be a, a vector of constants and then also some a letter times vector, letter times vector, letter times vector. Okay. Okay. So I want to describe that looking at the form of the solution set. So here is a, just like the previous one that I just showed you a second ago. Here is a system. Gauss's method gives you some answer, gives you echelon form. You take the echelon form, you, you put like so. And now I want to ask you to notice something about those. If you take z and w, you can take them to be anything you like, they're free. If you take z and w to be zero, well, then this part zero, this part zero, and you just get the vector of constants, so the 12 fifth for x, the minus 1 fifth for y, the zero for z, and the zero for w. That is to say that this vector here in the solution set is a particular solution of the original system. That if you plug in 12 fifths for x and minus 1 fifth for y and zero for z and zero for w, you'll get two. And if you plug in 12 fifths for x and minus 1 fifth for y and zero for z and zero for w, you'll get five. So this is a particular, this one here is a particular solution of the linear system. So we can understand this solution set in some way by understanding the parts, and we're starting off by understanding the part of that, that very first part, the vector of constants. Okay? To understand the rest, to understand the, uh, the vector times a letter, vector times a letter stuff, I want to isolate on a particular kind of, uh, on a special kind of linear system. I want to take those, uh, the, the constants on the right hand side, the constants over here on the right hand side, the two and the five, I want to take them and change them into zeros. If you change the, the two and the five into zeros, then what you get is a system that is simpler in the following sense. I can tell at a glance that it has the solution x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, and x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, w equals 0. So the vector of zeros definitely solves this system. So I know one of the particular solutions of this system. It is the vector of zeros. Gauss's method goes through the exact same steps, and you end up with a, end up with a solution set that uh, I didn't bother to write the vector of zeros. So I have vector times a letter, vector times a letter. So this is the other half of the general solution. Back here I had a general solution that had a, a, a vector with some constants in it and then vector times a letter, vector times a letter. Well here I've managed to isolate on the vector times a letter, vector times a letter stuff by turning those into zeros. So in general, when you look at a linear equation like the top line or the bottom line here that has a zero on the right hand side, you say that a linear equation is homogeneous if it has a constant of zero. So it has a zero on, the, on that right hand side, homogeneous. And of course the system is homogeneous uh, uh, if it has all zeros on the right hand side. Now homogeneous systems are linear systems. So they're just like other linear systems, except they have one special property. The homogeneous system can have infinitely many solutions. Look at this one here, can have, has infinitely many solutions. Homogeneous system can have a unique solution. This one here has a unique solution. But we know one of the solutions for a homogeneous system is all zeros. For example, if you plug x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, you definitely get one of the infinitely many. If you plug x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, you get the one solution here. So that is to say that homogeneous systems are linear systems, but they cannot have the no solutions possibility. That can't happen with a homogeneous system. 
Oops, I spelled solution wrong. Oops. Okay, so in general, if you have a homogeneous system, then the solution set has to look like this. Vector times a letter, vector times a letter, vector times a letter, however many you've got. It's how many will you have? It says k is the number of free variables. So when we had z and w for free variables, why we had two vectors. Now, uh, I'm going to do something here um, that, that uh, we do sometimes. Uh, rather than give a proof for the lemma, proof is in the book, but rather than give a proof for the lemma, we're going to try to convey the idea here of the proof by giving an example. Of course, you should refer to the book for the proof. That's the right thing to do. So I want to instead convey the idea of the proof, since the slides are intended to introduce the, the, uh, the, introduce the discussion that's in the book. Okay, so for the main idea here, you consider this system of homogeneous equations, and using the bottom equation, you get, uh, you can express y in terms of z and w. O okay, that's fine, but notice that when you do, there's no constants or a constant of zero, whichever way you like to say it. If you take the value of y and you substitute into the top equation, again, no constants, or a constant of zero, whatever way you like to say it, and so you get x expressed in terms of z and w with no constants. So you end up with no constants or a constant of zero. So you end up with z times, uh, z times a vector, w times a vector, no vector of constants, or again, a, a particular solution of the zero vector. And then this right here, two, minus 2, 1, 1, 0, that's the beta 1. And 0, minus 1, 0, 1, that's the beta k, if the k is 2 within the case. So we have that the general solution can be written as a vector times a letter, vector times a letter, vector times a letter. Okay, so the homogeneous solution set is special in some way that we have a characterization of how you can write it, and that stems from the fact that, that when you have a homogeneous system, it, the particular solution is, the, there is a particular solution that is the zero vector. Okay, so in general then, for a linear system in any particular solution, P, the, the solution set it looks of this form, P plus H. You can, if you give me a linear system, I can write its solution set in this form where H satisfies the associated homogeneous system and P is any particular solution. Now this one we are going to prove. I am going to go through the argument. It's not very long, but it, uh, it involves two steps. This says that the set of solutions can be written in this form. Set of solutions equals this set here, where P is any particular solution. So this is two sets, a set of solutions and this set here. To show that two sets are equal, the most straightforward thing to do, not the only thing to do, but the most straightforward thing to do is to show that each one is a subset of the other. And that's what we're going to do here. To give the proof, I, I couldn't fit it all in one slide, so it's on the second slide too. But to, to give the proof, I, I'm going to show, first of all, that if a vector is in the solution set, then it is in this set also. And then on the second slide, I'm going to show that if a vector is in the, the, the set given, the P plus H set, then that vector solves the system. So that's called mutual inclusion. I'm going to show set inclusion both directions. If a vector solves the system, then it's of this form. OK, so to show that, what do I have to do? Well, you assume that S solves the system. So then uh, uh, I want to show that S minus P is the right form for H. If I show that S minus P equals H, why then S equals P plus H? OK, so what is H? H means that when you plug the, the components of the vector in, then you've got to get 0. That's what homogeneous system means. OK, so I'm taking the components of S minus P and plugging them into each equation. Now, I'm only going to show one equation, of course, but I'm taking the components of S minus P and plugging them into that one equation. Well, you do some algebra here, so let's see. You distribute the A's, and you get uh, A's times S's minus A's times P's. Well, A's times S's gives you D. That's exactly what S is a solution of the system, so that's exactly what that means. A's times S's. A's times the components of S gives you D. And P is a particular solution also of the system, so, uh, so A's times P's gives you D, and they're D minus D zero. So that's exactly what I needed to show. I needed to show that S minus P has the right form for H. H is a, a vector that has the property that when you plug it into the left-hand side of the linear system, it will give you zero. OK, so that's half of the argument. I have to show the other half of the argument. The other half is that if a vector has this form, particular solution plus a member of the set of 
of homogeneous solutions, then it, then it is a solution of the system that you started with. So for you take a vector of the form p plus h, and you want to you want to show that um, that p plus h solves the given system. So that's just a matter of plugging the components of the vector p plus h I into each equation. So here I plug the components of the vector p plus h, the first component all the way down to the nth component of, of the vector p plus h. I plugged it into the, into the equation. I did the obvious algebra. I distributed the a's. So I have the a's times the p's and the a's times the h's a is times the p's, p is a particular solution of the linear system. So a times the p's gives you d. h, on the other hand, is a solution of the homogeneous system. And I know we only just saw the definition a few minutes ago, but the homogeneous system is the one with zeros on the right-hand side. So a's times the h's gives you zero. And d plus zero gives you d. Whoops. So in general here, we can always write the solution set in this form. We can always write the solution set in the form we started out the day by looking at here. You have particular solution, and here you have um, uh, the what the homogeneous solutions are: ve vector times a letter, vector times a letter. Okay. Now we like this for uh, a number of reasons. Um, one is that uh, uh, I can write down the solution of a linear system and understand completely what the solution set of a linear system looks like. It looks like any particular solution, any particular solution at all that you find can go there. And then here is vector times a letter, vector times a letter, vector times a letter, etc. I just copied that from the solution of the homogeneous. That's the H part. And in particular, what happens here is that by looking at the previous slide, but there's the previous slide. By looking at the previous slide and understanding what the various parts can be, I can see that solution sets of linear systems have three possibilities. Solution sets of linear systems are either empty, have one element, that is to say there's a unique solution, or else have infinitely many elements. Those are the three possibilities that can happen here. I have a, a nice box on the next slide that I'm going to point to. So in this box, this little array here, there are two possibilities. Either a particular solution exists yet or, or else it doesn't. And we've certainly seen linear systems that don't have a solution, so that would be the bottom line. Well, if a linear system doesn't have a solution, then there's just no solution. That's all there is to it. On the other hand, if a linear system does have a solution, if a linear system does, whoops, I went too far. If a linear system does have a solution, if there is a P that you could write there, then what can happen for the homogeneous case? What can happen with homogeneous systems? And you'll remember from a couple slides ago, homogeneous systems are just like regular systems, except there's one thing that can't happen. So here we go in the box. Homogeneous systems can have infinitely many. Homogeneous systems can have unique, but they can't have the other case. They can't have no solutions. So we get this array here. So the number of solutions to the homogeneous system can be one or can be infinite many. And if the number of solutions to the homogeneous system is one and a particular solution exists, why then the, the, the system you started with has a unique solution. If the uh, number of solutions to the homogeneous system is infinitely many and a particular solution exists, then the system you started with has infinitely many solutions. And of course, the no solutions case means that there's no particular solution. Okay, and just to close, uh, uh, let me sneak a word in here uh, uh, before, we, before I let you go. So an important special case is when the linear system has the same number of equations as unknowns. So when you do, when you look at the matrix of coefficients for that linear system, there's two cases. Either it has a unique solution or else it, is, uh, or else it doesn't. So uh, in the case where the matrix of coefficients of the homogeneous system has a unique solution, you say that it, that matrix is non-singular. Non-singular here means something like normal or usual or uh, doesn't stand out or not particularly problematic. On the other hand, if the homogeneous system has infinitely many solutions, if we're looking at that case, if the homogeneous system with that matrix of coefficients has infinitely many solutions, then we say that the matrix is singular. And singular here has the connotation of being a little bit odd or a little bit troublesome or, or mathematically interesting, whatever way you like to say it. Now, there, there is something a little odd, a little peculiar about the terminology. It, it is the case, I, I, I didn't mess this up. 
non-singular is associated with unique solution. I know that's confusing, but it's the right word. It's the standard word. Non-singular is associated with unique solution, and singular is associated with not unique solution. Uh, that's true. But this is the standard way of using the words, and again, you have to think of the other meaning of non-singular and singular. If you're like reading a Sherlock Holmes novel and it says, you know, the singular case of the dancing men, singular means stands out or peculiar or interesting or somewhat unusual, and that's what's, that's what's intended to happen here. Non-singular case is the case where you find that the linear system has exactly one solution, the homogeneous system has exactly one solution. That's kind of the expected or the usual or the typical. Okay, very good, very good. That ends the first chapter, so I'll let you go. And uh, excuse me, it ends the first section, so I'll let you go. And and I'll see you next time with the second section, the vectors in space. Very good. Okay, bye bye.